Let me welcome everyone uh, to this 17th annual Wallace Stegner Center Young Scholar Lecture. Uh, I'm Bob Keiter, uh, Director of the Wallace Stegner Center for Land Resources and the Environment uh, at the University of Utah S.J. Quinney College of Law. And we're very pleased to have you joining us today. We regret uh, that we are proceeding uh, virtually uh, but the circumstances are such as uh, everyone uh, understands uh, that uh, uh, we're just uh, happy to be able to uh, proceed in this time of an ongoing pandemic. Uh, uh, let me uh, begin uh, here by uh, giving the native land acknowledgement that is customary at the beginning of Stegner Center events. We acknowledge that this land, which is named for the Ute tribe, is a traditional and ancestral homeland of the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshute, and Ute tribes. The University of Utah recognizes and respects the enduring relationship that exists between many indigenous peoples and their traditional homelands. We respect the sovereign relationship between tribes, states, and the federal government, and we affirm the University of Utah's commitment to a partnership with Native nations and urban Indian communities through research, education, and community outreach activities. Uh, a couple uh, uh, notes about Stegner Center future events. Uh, first of all, uh, this is our final event of this fall semester, but next semester uh, we will host several noon hour uh, green bag uh, events uh, as we have uh, during the fall semester. Uh, I'll simply mention uh, one of them on the 24th of February. We'll be joined by Professor Richard Lazarus from the Harvard Law School, uh, who will be speaking about uh, environmental law in the Supreme Court. Uh, he has quite a bit of experience uh, arguing environmental cases before uh, the Supreme Court. Uh, and has written extensively about that uh, experience and the institution. So please join us for that. And please check the Stegner Center website for notice of our other uh, planned uh, green bag noon hour presentations during the fall semester. I'd also like to note on March 17th and 18th, the Stegner Center will host our 27th annual symposium on the topic of the Colorado River Compact navigating uh, the future. Uh, this uh, symposium is being held in conjunction with the Colorado River Compact's 2022 centennial. Uh, it will reflect upon the past century of water management and envision our common future, including strategies to share water, engage tribes, integrate environmental consideration and adapt uh, to client change. Again, uh, more information is available uh, on uh, the calendar of events uh, pay, uh, uh, slot on the Stegner Center website. Uh, the Young Scholar uh, Program here at the Stegner Center was founded in 2005 with the goal of recognizing and establishing a relationship with promising young scholars early in their academic careers Recipients are selected based on their accomplishments, the quality of their academic work, and their promise in the field of environmental, natural resources, uh, law, and policy. I'd like to thank, uh, on behalf of the Stegner Center, the Cultural Vision Fund, uh, which is the founding donor for this uh, program. Uh, the Cultural Vision Fund also provides support uh, for a variety of other Stegner Center programs, including our annual symposium, conferences, uh, and uh, our lecture series. Uh, please join me virtually in thanking uh, the Cultural Vision Fund uh, for uh, their support for the Young Scholar Program. Um, now, it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce uh, our 17th annual uh, Young Scholar, uh, Professor Etienne Toussaint, uh, who is an assistant professor of law 
at the University of South Carolina School of Law. He teaches contracts, business associations, secure transactions, and other courses related to business law, political economy, and critical theory. Uh, he has a focus on urban communities in the United States and has written extensively about the privatization of public good through social impact investing, the promise of the solidarity economy for equitable community development, and uh, the ritualization of right, white supremacy in racially segregated communities through fair housing initiatives, and also examined uh, the structural extermination of marginalized citizens from urban landscapes through neoliberal farming programs. Uh, his articles have appeared in a number of uh, legal journals, uh, and he has uh, existing or forthcoming articles in the California Law Review, the Harvard Environmental Law Review, the Columbia Human Rights Law Review, the Michigan Journal of Law Re uh, Reform, uh, and uh, several others. Uh, he's a graduate of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where he earned a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering, he also learned a Master of Science in Environmental Engineering at the Johns Hopkins University. And uh, Professor Toussaint's uh, JD is from Harvard Law School. He previously served as a board member of the Washington Council of Lawyers in Washington, DC, and currently uh, serves as a member of the American Bar Association Commission on Homelessness and Poverty. Uh, let me note uh, that at the uh, conclusion of his talk, uh, we invite questions uh, and uh, you can uh, send a question uh, virtually through the Q&A function uh, at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Uh, with that, uh, I'm pleased to welcome as our 17th annual Wallace Stegner Center Young Scholar, Professor Etienne Toussaint, who will address the topic of the indignity of food insecurity. Thank you for joining us, Etienne. Thank you so much. And let me begin uh, before I share my screen by just thanking Dean Warner, Professor Keiter and the Wallace Stegner Center for Land Resources and the Environment for the honor of being in conversation with you today. The work of the Wallace Stegner Center on Environmental Law and Policy, Environmental Justice and Natural Resource Conservation is tremendously necessary perhaps now more than ever as our, as our nation confronts the realities of climate change and its implications for our everyday lives. Uh, so I'm humbled to be included among the list of esteemed previous scholars of the center and to be granted an opportunity to share with you today. The great Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu who wrote the Tao Te Ching declared, those who know do not speak, those who speak do not know. Although I'm a law professor and all law professors love to speak, I tend to agree. Thus, I must confess, perhaps to your chagrin, I do not know how to solve food insecurity in the United States. My goal today is to probe the relationship between food security and dignity to unearth questions that might help us better understand why the problem still exists in the United States and why ongoing attempts to solve it continue to fall short. Let us begin our conversation the way most do, with a story. I grew up in the South Bronx, New York, and spent several years obsessed with White Castle hamburger sliders. It became a weekly tradition, a cheap and savory reprieve from the monotony of Sunday afternoons before the sound of my grandmother's voice on Monday mornings would snap me back into my weekday routine. As one might expect, I was a chubby kid. While my mother would not dare to buy me the latest overpriced Air Jordan sneakers, our fridge and snack cabinet was rarely empty. As a result, when I first heard the phrase food desert, I did not think of my home in the Bronx, a place where Seatown Supermarket was nestled between the bus stop and two corner store bodegas, and Chinese food takeout spots dotted almost every block under the elevated train tracks. But when I learned about the phrase food swamp, a spatial metaphor to describe neighborhoods where fast food and junk food inundate healthy alternatives, I immediately thought about White Castle, McDonald's, Subways, Domino's, Popeyes, Kennedy Fried Chicken, Dunkin' Donuts, 
and several other lesser known fast food restaurants, all within a one mile radius of my Bronx home. And I found myself questioning, what does it mean to grow up in a so-called swamp, an overwhelming yet uncultivated place, a place inhabited by dangerous creatures, a place of transition, and emerge, I suppose, as one of America's swamp things. Little did I know that the emergence of the novel coronavirus would provide a clear answer. In the spring of 2020, COVID-19 killed the predominantly low-income Black and Hispanic populations living in the Bronx at almost twice the rate of New York City's four other boroughs. Other low-income racially and ethnically, ethnically minoritized communities across the country, from cities in Michigan to Louisiana, Illinois, North Carolina, Wisconsin, and even the nation's capital, Washington, D.C., have been equally ravaged. Public health experts trace the heightened risk of mortality from COVID-19 among such populations to their high rates of diabetes, asthma, and hypertension, among other comorbidities. Yet food justice activists deepen the analysis by calling attention to structural racism in global food systems operating at local scale. This is perhaps best illuminated by the prevalence of food insecurity in low income and racially and ethnically minoritized neighborhoods nationwide. The US Department of Agriculture defines food insecurity as a lack of consistent access to enough food for an active, healthy life. You might be curious why technology has not solved the problem. Advancements in digital and mobile technology and the promise of two-day shipping from distribution companies like Amazon have certainly enabled many families to avoid the risk of COVID-19 through virtual food markets. However, unequal access to food delivery via mobile apps cuts across both class and racial divides. Not only do low-income communities face a digital divide, but the added cost of food delivery renders such technolo technological innovations financially impracticable. Even more, technological innovations can obscure the material disadvantages of marginalized populations. While the technology offers salvation for those who can benefit from home delivery services, it beckons uncompensated sacrifice from others as essential low-wage food delivery drivers or essential packaging warehouse workers and the like. As a result, even technology has struggled to resolve the limited access to affordable, fresh, and nutrient-rich food that plagues many low-income neighborhoods. In response to such challenges, local governments have prioritized local food production to reduce food insecurity. However, even well-intentioned urban farming programs, for example, can entrench market-centric norms, such as colorblind policies that limit governmental interventions or promote individualistic competition that ultimately perpetuate the very structural inequities they seek to overcome. Washington, D.C.'s history of urban farming legislation, which has yet to solve food insecurity in Washington, D.C.'s low income and predominantly Black wards, provides but one example. Further, even when lawmakers propose progressive food justice programs that address historic racial discrimination in the food industry, such as the Biden administration's federal debt relief program for Black farmers under the American Rescue Plan, they are deemed unconstitutional racial discrimination and halted before they can yield positive results. As a result, there appears to be a dilemma. How does one resolve food insecurity catalyzed by structural racism in food markets without violating the Constitution's prohibition against racial discrimination in public welfare programming? Allow me to explore this question with you in four steps. First, Let's begin by framing the issue of food insecurity as a matter of human dignity and querying whether the residents of food insecure neighborhoods experience food related dignitary harms. Then we will briefly revisit the rise of food insecurity in the United States, beginning with human chattel slavery and making our way to the modern era of food apartheid. Third, we'll complicate matters by considering whether food related dignitary harms are animated by food laws and public policies that reconstitute and perpetuate vestiges of United States human chattel slavery. If we discover this to be true, or at least persuasive, then the liberty deprivation 
that enslaves communities to food insecurity not only hinders public health, but also calls into question both the spirit and letter of the 13th Amendment to the Constitution. However, can a colorblind Constitution reckon with food insecurity's racial dilemma? Neutral urban farming programs don't seem to meet the needs of the most food insecure families, and race-based food programs are met with pushback for being racist. Part four of our discussion will consider whether enforcing the 13th Amendment to uproot vestiges of slavery and food markets, uh, met metaphorically, calls for a more progressive vision of the Constitution that affirms social and economic rights as foundational to human dignity and equal citizenship. I argue that it does, lest we continue to fall short of eradicating food insecurity. To consider whether food insecurity can inflict food-related dignitary harms on populations living within food insecure neighborhoods, we must first clarify a legal conception of human dignity. The concept of dignity has been increasingly invoked by the United States Supreme Court in recent years across a diversity of legal cases, from disputes on gun rights to matters of freedom of speech and the death penalty. Yet, its usage in United States jurisprudence is relatively recent, having gained prominence only after the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948 made dignity a central pillar of human rights discourse. As a result, its meaning, not only as a moral, philosophical, or religious concept, but also as a legal concept, remains in dispute. Some courts have defined dignity as the inherent worth of each individual, a presumption of equality that does not depend upon social rank or other external measures of individual worth. Under this equality framing of dignity, humanity is defined by one's inherent capabilities for human endeavors, such as the capacity for human reason. Other courts use dignity to describe the act of expressing one's inherent humanity in community with others, free from unjustified interference. Under this liberty framing of dignity, Dignity is defined as one's freedom to exercise inherent human capabilities through individual human agency. Still other courts describe dignity as the integrity that one experiences while pursuing well-being through individual human agency. Under this integrity framing of dignity, dignity is defined as one's ability to experience a fully integrated personal identity, in encompassing both a positive self-perception and a reputable social recognition that affirms one's membership in a society as a citizen. I believe that all three of these popular framings of human dignity as a philosophical concept, dignity as equality, dignity as liberty, and dignity as integrity, should be viewed by courts not as discrete moral concepts to be exploited as rhetorical devices for constitutional arguments about equality or liberty, but instead as integrated elements of a unified ontological conception of the human condition essential to one's membership within a political society. Let us assume then, let us assume then for the purposes of our discussion that human dignity as a legal concept is defined as one, the equal opportunity to express inherent human capabilities, two, without the unjustified constraint of others, and three, toward the full development of an integrated personhood. In this way, dignity as a legal concept describes a state of humanity necessary for the full enjoyment of constitutional rights and liberties. Based upon this framing of human dignity, the three elements of human dignity reveal three possible dignitary harms that individually or collectively can injure one's ability to experience human dignity in the context of membership in a political society. To elucidate how such harms can manifest at the hands of fellow citizens or at the hands of the state, let us explore food insecurity as a type of dignitary harm. Consider first the condition of food insecurity as an equality-based dignitary harm. How might an equality-based dignitary harm arise in the context of food insecurity. 
First, assume that access to certain kinds of food in sufficient quantities is a necessary condition of experiencing inherent human dignity. According to the United Nations Committee on World Food Security, food security is defined as having physical, social, and economic access to sufficient nutrient-rich and healthy food to sustain an active and healthy lifestyle. If one agrees that activity and health is integral to autonomous human decision-making in pursuit of human well-being, then the point requires no further explanation. Like racial or gender-based discrimination in the public accommodations or the voting context, one's inability to physically access sufficient nutrient-rich and healthy food to pursue human well-being due to discrimination that is based upon a suspect classification might be appropriately defined as an equality-based dignitary harm in the food context. The easy case would be that of intentional discrimination that limits one's access to food markets, such as prohibiting a person from accessing a grocery store based upon their gender or race. Civil rights laws already address such concerns. The more difficult case would be unintentional discrimination that limits one's access to nutrient-rich and healthy food based upon a law, public policy, or social policy that disproportionately impacts members of a suspect class. For example, consider the case of a racially homogenous low-income neighborhood residing within a food desert, an area with limited access to nutrient-rich and healthy food sources. Even more difficult still, given the United Nations incorporation of social and economic access into its definition of food security, would be the case of discrimination based upon cultural or economic reasons. For example, consider the case of a racially homogenous low-income neighborhood residing within a food swamp, an area replete with unhealthy and non-nutritious fast food alternatives and limited health options that are overpriced. Or consider the example of an ethnic community residing in a neighborhood with limited access to certain cultural foods. Or consider yet still the example of a gentrifying neighborhood where new grocery stores and supermarkets offer food that existing low-income residents cannot afford. What these examples demonstrate is that one can experience opportunities to physically access food markets, yet still face equality-based dignitary harms because such equality of opportunity is not equitable. In other words, although everyone has an opportunity, all opportunities are not made the same. To be sure, the critic will argue that equality of opportunity afforded by anti-discrimination laws are sufficient. To such critics, individuals who face either physical, social, or economic barriers to food not based on discrimination across suspect classifications should move, adapt, or simply work harder. After all, if inherent dignity is grounded in the capacity for human agency, and if equality of dignity means we must not rank the worthiness of different modes of expressing dignity through agency, then isn't the purpose of law to minimize barriers for the individual pursuit of well-being in a way that enables others to do the same. Such views express a fundamentally negative conception of liberty. That is a sense of liberty as freedom from the interference of others or the state in one's exercise of human autonomy. Yet before we get ahead of ourselves, we must conclude here that the critics are partly right. As, I, as Isaiah Berlin explained, it is important to discriminate between liberty and the conditions of its exercise. If a man is too poor or too ignorant or too feeble to make use of his legal rights, the liberty that these rights confer upon him is nothing to him, but it is thereby annihilated, end quote. In other words, liberty guarantees not the realization of one's conception of a worthwhile life, but only its pursuit. Thus, being free to experience equality of opportunity in recognition of one's inherent dignity only guarantees that one can pursue equality. It does not guarantee that one will not be met by socioeconomic barriers to experiencing the good life, 
or that one will not be met by socioeconomic conditions that make the pursuit of the good life pointless. These insights suggest that one can experience equality as dignity, yet still face other dignitary harms. Consider next the case of liberty-based dignitary harms. How might a liberty-based ba liberty dignitary harm arise in the case of food insecurity? Again, assume that access to certain food in sufficient quantities is a necessary condition of experiencing inherent human dignity as expressed by human agency. Previously, we concluded that an equality-based dignitary harm in the context of food access would arise when a food market barred the entry of a person based upon a suspect classification, such as race or gender. Further, we noted that the, absent, that the absence of food markets or the absence of certain types of food beneficial to certain cultures due to law, public policy, or social policy might be viewed as a type of unintentional equality-based dignitary harm because it is deemed inequitable. The concept of liberty addresses not the existence of food markets, but instead the freedom one enjoys in pursuing them. Thus, the liberty question considers not merely physical access, but also economic and social access to food. To be sure, whether one identifies a liberty-based dignitary harm depends upon how one defines liberty. Does one embrace a purely negative conception of liberty as freedom from unjustified interference, or does one integrate a more positive conception of liberty as also including freedom from external domination? Consider, for example, a socioeconomic a socioeconomically diverse neighborhood with a centrally located food supermarket. A view of liberty as freedom from interference asks, do all residents enjoy equal opportunities to visit the grocery store? While some may walk to the store in the morning and others may drive to the store in the evening, the focus is on whether all individuals can exploit the resources at their disposal to visit the grocery store and pursue their individual vision of well being as it pertains to food consumption. Socioeconomic inequities will undoubtedly challenge some more than others, and government resources may even aid those who face such challenges, such as a comprehensive busing system that aids those who cannot afford vehicles or live further away from the store. But this view of liberty does not require that all pursuits be equal in their level of ease simply that such pursuits are free from the unjustified interference of others. In contrast, a more ca capacious framing of liberty that considers domination as, are there social, economic, or cultural barriers that dominate the decision-making of certain individuals as they pursue food markets? Do certain individuals face increased food prices due to their location within the neighborhood? Do certain individuals face increased transportation costs because of the design of public transportation routes? Do certain individuals fail to earn sufficient income to acquire the healthy and nutrient-rich food necessary for their well-being? Do certain individuals fail to receive adequate education about nutrition or healthy dieting to make beneficial food consumption choices? These are just some of the ways that individuals may experience liberty-based dignitary harms in the context of food security, even when they can, in theory, physically access food markets. When structural conditions that hinder liberty are normalized for certain individuals, or when structural conditions that hinder liberty are deemed culturally acceptable for certain communities, the implicit rationale is an unspoken societal belief that such individuals or communities lack the worthiness of more privileged communities. The failure of society to recognize the worthiness or inherent dignity of certain individuals or communities speaks to a third integrity-based dignitary harm. How might an integrity-based harm arise in the context of food security? Once again, 
assume that access to certain food in sufficient quantities is a necessary condition of experiencing inherent human dignity and pursuing well-being through liberty. One must eat in order to act, and one must eat enough healthy food in order to thrive. We noted earlier that an equality-based dignitary harm focuses on one's ability to access food markets free from discrimination. And a liberty-based dignitary harm focuses on one's ability to pursue food markets that appear to be accessible by conventional measures, but are blocked by social or economic barriers, such as challenges related to food pricing or knowledge about healthy food options. An integrity-based dignitary harm in the context of food security focuses on one's ability to experience integrity, both self-respect and social recognition of one's inherent worthiness in their relationship to food markets. That is, are there constraints on the individual capacity to experience and present oneself to the community as a fully integrated whole person in one's pursuit of food security? For example, consider a mixed income and racially diverse community. For low-income members of such communities, are affordable food options available at all food markets? Or must they shop at specific stores that may induce feelings of embarrassment or shame? Must they present colored stamps to obtain affordable food? Or line up in certain aisles to use their EBT cards? For certain racial or ethnic groups in the community, are culturally appropriate food options available at all food markets? Or must they shop at specific stores that affirm their cultural dietary needs? Within food markets that cater to diverse groups, are affordable and healthy food options dispersed throughout the store? Or are such stores segregated, such that individuals might experience shame or embarrassment as they navigate different aisles targeting different socioeconomic groups? perhaps an aisle with luxury organic food options up front and an aisle with cultural food options further in the back and an aisle with cheap processed food options off to the side. Even more, do individuals possess the necessary material conditions to garner social recognition and thereby experience integrity as they pursue food insecurity? Here then, the demands of integrity converge with those of liberty? Does one have the social and economic resources to pursue enough healthy food to garner the respect of their peers? Does one have enough income to purchase healthy food, access to transportation to pursue healthy food markets, access to education about healthy nutrition? Does one have housing and energy services to store healthy food? Must one sacrifice purchasing healthy food options and rely upon fast food alternatives to pay for other essentials, such as healthcare? Is one's community inundated with unhealthy food alternatives, creating a culture of unhealthy eating that becomes a social norm, and also underscores a sense that such communities do not deserve more? In this way, the existence of both food deserts and food swamps emerge as integrity-based dignitary harms because they reflect a lack of social esteem for the inherent worthiness of such residents to enjoy greater access to healthy and nutrient-rich food alternatives. In other words, the harm is in the neglect. And ultimately, as we think about dignitary-based harms, the underlying question is who is to blame? All this theory is provocative but it's only relevant if food insecurity is an issue in the United States. Well, the history of food insecurity in the United States is rather complex. On the one hand, it tracks the general progression of economic development and public health in our modern age. Advancements in food production, technology, and access to healthcare information has facilitated the reduction of poverty and food deprivation across time. Yet on the other hand, since the founding of the United States, diverse political views, often influenced by religious and cultural ideologies, 
have shaped the role of government in protecting the social and economic well-being of citizens. While some citizens have called for a welfare state political system, others, perhaps wary of state power, have advocated for a more conservative, perhaps libertarian style of governance. The history of progressivism in the United States from the Reconstruction Amendments to the New Deal demonstrates a broad-based political will among some to address inequality head on. However, scholars argue that the conservative push for a laissez-faire style capitalist economy that emphasizes the freedom of markets as a corrective for social and economic inequities has also rendered, has also rendered arguably our government at the federal, state, and local levels complicit with poverty. Such complicity with and perhaps accountability for the harms of poverty are most visible during the antebellum period. During the era of state-sanctioned enslavement and the socio-political culture of white supremacy that governed the Southern plantation economy and dominated the United States landscape more generally, we saw an advancement of a program of structural oppression with food insecurity as a weapon. Food-related dignitary harms were weaponized by enslavers to subjugate the black population and further their labor exploitation. Yet even after the abolition of slavery, food insecurity was continually employed to subordinate both low income and racially and ethnically minoritized communities. From the reconstruction period into the Jim Crow era, such concentrated exposure to food related dignitary harms catalyzed into modern food apartheid neighborhoods that persist today. Consider first the food oppression met by the enslaved. Plantation owners across the Southern United States wielded total control over food access and food quality for the enslaved black population during the antebellum era. To oppress enslaved black people and perpetuate their labor exploitation, planter Plantation owners relied upon at least three methods of food oppression. First, enslavers rationed food to their enslaved workers based upon their perceived economic value. Since enslaved people were deemed economic property to be traded in slave markets or pledged as human chattel to secure business loans, enslavers rationed food based on a strict analysis of opportunity cost and the prospect of future profits. Stronger and more economically productive male slaves were customarily fed more food than weaker and less productive women and children. Enslavers also balanced the benefits of maintaining strength in plantation fields with the cost of food and the ever-present threat of slave revolts. And thus, while best practices of the day for slave management encouraged a healthy diet of unlimited vegetables for enslaved workers, Antebellum slavery periodicals also encouraged allotments of meat and grain that corresponded with an enslaved worker's unique role on the plantation. Second, enslavers perpetuated food oppression by largely ignoring the unique exposure of their enslaved workers to food-related diseases, which was principally due to their unhealthy diets and poor living and working conditions. Enslaved workers not only suffered from a lack of adequate food, which generated illness, but their food options were bereft of important vitamins and nutrients for healthy human growth and functioning. Forced to toil under food conditions that evoke today's conception of a food desert, an area with limited access to affordable and nutrient-rich healthy food, Black people in antebellum America suffered from a wide range of food-related illnesses and diseases. Children often suffered the most, many dying in the first year of life from malnutrition, especially after being forcibly weaned from their mothers at three months of age and fed a diet of gruel or cornmeal porridge until the age of three. For those who made it to adulthood, diseases that are now commonly associated with so-called developing countries were prominent, included, including rickets, tetany, anemia, scurvy, and others. Enslavers justified such widespread disease and high rates of mortality among black people with racist theories 
about the supposedly inferior physiological and genetic composition of Africans, thereby justifying their status as slaves and their denial of equality, liberty, and dignity. Third, enslavers perpetuated food oppression by isolating enslaved Africans in racially segregated communities that suffered from food deprivation and limited resources for food production. On the Southern plantation, the enslaved lived together in segregated quarters when not working, and they were not ordinarily allowed to grow or hunt their own food. As a result, starvation was common among enslaved Black Americans alongside food theft as a strategy for survival. However, death or disease from food deprivation was not usually due to a lack of food on the plantation. Rather, food deprivation was intentionally leveraged as a means for the enslaver to weaken the spirit of the enslaved and degrade Black people's human dignity. Beyond the establishment of unequal living conditions and the enforcement of slave codes that limited everyday liberties, such as limitations on speech and assembly, food deprivation served to destroy the integrity of Black people. The creation of food deserts on the Southern plantation served to demean Black humanity, bolster white supremacy, and grant political legitimacy to the slave economy, notwithstanding pressures from abolitionists to end the slave trade. While plantation owners claimed that their human chattel was no more than economic property, many white Americans in antebellum America were well aware and conscious of the fundamental humanity of the Black people they kept in bondage. Perhaps in recognition of the indignity of food deprivation, many states in fact made it illegal for enslavers to deprive their enslaved workers of adequate food. And in some instances, some states imposed damages upon enslavers when their enslaved workers stole food from other plantations. Notwithstanding these efforts to dampen the brutality of slavery, state laws had little material effect on the lives of enslaved workers as plantation owners were rarely convicted for withholding food from their human chattel. Indeed, some courts even deferred to local custom when defining appropriate standards for feeding enslaved workers, enabling white supremacist beliefs about black humanity to govern the meaning of adequacy with respect to enslaved workers' diets, and enabling enslavers to mitigate their gross negligence by forcing their enslaved workers to steal food. As a result, control over food access and food quality remained a primary weapon for enslavers to beat their human chattel into submission with food oppression, and they did so without reservation. Emancipation transitioned the formerly enslaved population into a new state of unfreedom. Here we'll transition into food insecurity as it relates to the emerging Jim Crow era. Without access to land, adequate housing, adequate health care, adequate education, or adequate nutrient-rich and healthy food, Black Americans after emancipation literally became sick from freedom, from freedom. As Jim Downs explains, disease and sickness had a more devastating and fatal effect on emancipated slaves than on soldiers, since ex-slaves often lacked the basic necessities to survive. As a result, while some Black people braved the wilderness of the Western terrain and vied for access to land with limited economic resources for business development and little to no governmental protection from racial terrorists, many others returned to their former plantations and were ushered into slavery by another name, sharecropping. Equipped with oppressive contracts that were tainted by coercion and economic duress in their formation, white planters enlisted Black people to perform the same toil they had endured as enslaved workers on the same land that had previously served as their prison in exchange for their opportunity to eat food and survive. In many ways, emancipated life for Black people replicated their former lives as human chattel, rendering sharecropping as simply a vestige of slavery. Sharecropping was also structured to perpetuate food oppression. For example, landlords of former slave plantations offered their new sharecroppers the ability to purchase food on credit. In this way, since the formerly enslaved had few other options, landlords retained complete control over their workers' diets. The food selection was no different 
than the menu offered to formerly enslaved workers, a diet of cornmeal, molasses, and rations of meat. As one might expect, food-related diseases and death among Black people persisted. The food culture of the slave plantation persisted as well. After surviving generations of the slave diet, even when some Black people finally obtained their own farmland, they sometimes retained the taste for and habit of eating plantation food. Many Black people would eventually decide to leave the South altogether during the Great Migration. However, the North proved to be no better than the South. In racially segregated urban environments, Black people moved into available housing in glorified shanty towns that lacked living wage jobs, adequate housing, adequate education, adequate public health services, and adequate access to healthy and nutrient-rich food. As a result, while many Black people in the South continue to live on or near former slave plantations, many people in the North populated urban versions of their old food deserts. Much like the slave plantations of antebellum America, Black people living in urban ghettos still struggled with food insecurity. As the transition from Reconstruction to Jim Crow saw sustained food oppression in many Black communities, Black Americans were not the only people suffering from food insecurity at the turn of the 20th century. We must remember, stemming from 15th century English poor laws, poverty has long been viewed as a personal moral failing, not as an indication of labor exploitation or as an externality of competitive capitalist markets. Thus, even as the United States labor movement grew during the Reconstruction era in response to the social and economic impacts of the Industrial Revolution, public welfare and food assistance remained primarily the task of churches, charitable organizations, and wealthy philanthropists. While large cities often provided limited services for the unhoused in poor houses, it was not until the worldwide Great Depression of the 1930s, triggered by the 1929 stock market crash, that the federal government actually began taking an active role in food assistance. By 1932, unemployment in the United States had, had risen to 25%. Businesses and families were defaulting on loans. More than 5,000 banks had failed. And hundreds of thousands of Americans had become homeless. Farmers were suffering too. Agricultural prices and exports fell during the Depression. And as a result, farmers demanded relief from the federal government. Congress attempted to pass what was called the McNary-Hogan Farm Relief Act during the 1920s to subsidize agricultural prices, but the effort was vetoed by President Calvin Coolidge. And although President Herbert Hoover established the Federal Farm Board to fund farming cooperatives, the agricultural crisis continued. In fact, many blamed President Hoover for the failed economy and dubbed the development of informal shanty towns filled with shacks clustered near soup kitchens as Hoovervilles. The failing economy precipitated a shift in political power, launching the Democratic Party into leadership in 1933 under President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Roosevelt's New Deal focused on stimulating the economy and providing relief to impoverished communities, especially the agricultural community that had begun to destroy unsold food due to a surplus of produce that people could not afford. In 1933, Roosevelt launched the Commodity Credit Corporation to stabilize, support, and protect farm income and prices. He also created the Agricultural Adjustment Administration, which paid farmers subsidies to reduce their production of certain commodities, such as wheat and corn, to lower supply and raise prices. And he also made the temporary Farm Credit Administration, which refinanced farm mortgages to help stave off defaults. Of course, let's remember, although these programs were neutral on their face, they were unlikely beneficial for black farmers and other racially and, ethnic and ethnically minoritized populations. Aside from blatant racial discrimination, black farmers were primarily sharecroppers at this time. Further, black Americans and other non-farmers living in poverty and, and urban ghettos didn't get much relief from these programs until 1939 with the introduction of
of food stamps. Under Secretary of Agriculture Henry A. Wallace, the United States Department of Agriculture launched the first food stamp program in 1939, enabling low-income individuals to purchase color-coded food stamps using government relief funds, orange stamps for any food item, and blue stamps for surplus commodities. And they could use these stamps at retailers and purchase surplus produce from farms. Rather than simply give food away to needy families, it was believed that requiring program participants to purchase food stamps with relief funds would avoid the program as being viewed as a political handout. In a short matter of time, approximately 20 people were benefited with over $250 million in food subsidies. But the program was suspended in 1943 when food surpluses and unemployment rates declined. World War II began to unfold and progressive political leaders continued to advocate for a more permanent food program to address the food insecurity that remained in low-income communities nationwide. In 1944, Senators George Eichen of Vermont and Robert La Follette Jr. of Wisconsin proposed a national food allotment plan, which promoted a basic food allotment through coupons as a national strategy to bolster the health, efficiency, and morale of the civilian population. Unlike the original food stamp program, they focused on, they focused on selecting foods based on their nutritional value. But the bill was never passed. As, as Manan Nessel explains, while urban Democrats viewed food stamps as public welfare, distinct from commodity cult agriculture, farmers tended to oppose such bills because they were uncomfortable with giving handouts to low-income communities. Even when a two-year pilot program was finally approved by Congress in 1959, Republican President Dwight Eisenhower opted not to implement the program under political pressure to contain the expansion of federal welfare spending. As a result, during the era of Jim Crow segregation, prior to the advent of civil rights, food insecurity was aided but not resolved primarily by local welfare offices that provided monthly packages of lard, rice, flour, butter, and cheese to low-income families. For communities that lacked governmental support for food assistance, such as many segregated low-income communities nationwide, residents often turned to community gardening, or in some cases, cooperatively owned grocery stores as a solution. It would take until 1961 with the election of President John F. Kennedy for the food stamp program to be revived. On the day after his inauguration, President Kennedy issued an executive order to create a pilot food stamp program. The new program simplified food stamps by issuing one stamp for consumers with the price of the stamp tied to the recipient's source of uh, income level. The definition of eligible foods excluded foods imported from foreign sources, presumably to boost consumption of domestic products and benefit the agricultural sector. Yet many low-income households remained unable to even afford food stamps. In addition, Black sharecroppers in the South who lacked stable income and actually relied upon credit to obtain the items that they needed to live their everyday lives were forced to pay a premium if they wanted to access food stamps. Notwithstanding such concerns, President Lyndon B. Johnson was able to negotiate with the agricultural sector, garnering political support to make the food stamp program permanent. Food apartheid after the civil rights movement. In exchange for cotton and wheat subsidies, Rural Democrats agreed to support the Food Stamp Act of 1964. Although the original bill excluded luxury food items, perhaps to rein in the notion that low-income fa families were gaining an unfair handout to gain Republican support, the Senate rejected the exclusion due to administrative concerns. The final program was deemed a benefit for farmers and a benefit for food insecure communities. Yet it failed to resolve the problem of food insecurity, even as the program continued to grow in cost and size. By 1968, television documentaries such as the one on CBS, 
titled Hunger in America, would report that at least 30 million Americans were undernourished and did not receive federal food assistance. To address ongoing food insecurity, Richard Nixon lobbied, lobbied Congress in 1969 to increase food stamp benefits and eliminate the purchase requirement that hindered participation for extremely low income families. The 1970 food stamp amendment would implement such demands. And in 1973, the program would be amended again to include imported food and food producing seeds and plants among the list of eligible food items. However, the program remained politically divisive. The inclusion of imported food was met by a ban on hot and ready to eat food, which meant that the program was not meant for the unhoused, but only recipients who had access to a kitchen and cooking supplies. Yet even as the program remained politically contentious, later amendments continued to expand its reach. In 1977, Congress finally eliminated the purchase requirement. Although nutrition was increasingly raised by food justice advocates as a cause for concern in low-income neighborhoods, attempts to prohibit junk food from the program were ultimately rejected due to concerns over administrative complexity. Notwithstanding the inclusion of unhealthy junk food, the Food and Nutrition Service created by Richard Nixon back in 1969 continued to limit grocery store participation to those that prim primarily sold staple food products. Such requirements did not resolve the lack of healthy food options in low-income neighborhoods where food deserts were becoming food swamps. They simply limited where people with food stamps could go and buy food. The 1980s under President Ronald Reagan would usher a new level of political resistance to food stamps and other welfare programs aimed at addressing food insecurity. Driven by a pro-business agenda to decrease government spending, Reagan garnered political support to curtail welfare programs by appealing to racial tensions. On the campaign trail, Reagan painted food stamp recipients as, quote, strapping young bucks splurging on luxury foods. Or he, he termed individuals as, quote, welfare queens with intentions of abusing public assistance programs. Such tropes use racism as a vehicle to blame poverty and thereby blame food insecurity on the, on the so-called culture of poverty in low-income neighborhoods. Accordingly, the food stamp program was significantly amended during the Reagan era. Further, the uh, efforts were made to track the usage of food stamps in certain areas to stamp down on perceived illegal usages. When President Bill Clinton took office in 1993, he pledged to end welfare as we know it. In 1996, Clinton signed into law the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act, with, which further restricted food stamp program eligibility, reduced its benefits, and amplified its work requirements. At the same time, we saw a redefinition of the retail food store in the Food Stamp Act, which increased store eligibility, finally enabling convenience stores to now process food stamp benefits, even if staple food sales did not comprise a majority of convenience store sales, and even if convenience stores did not prioritize nutritious food options. Thus, as Clinton's welfare reform shrunk the pool of eligible food stamp recipients, it did little to address the lack of access to healthy and nutrient-rich food in low-income neighborhoods, and perhaps made matters worse in that regard. The 1990s would witness a shift to EBT debit cards, which certainly mitigated the social stigma previously associated with physical food stamps and yielded administrative benefits to the program. However, food justice activists would call attention to the challenges that food deserts and food swamps presented to food insecure neighborhoods, even with access to EBT cards. Indeed, the shift to EBT cards saw a reduction in farmers markets because the food stamp program did not provide farmers with the technology to accept the cards. Even as food justice advocates emphasize nutrition, 
uh, governments resisted calls to limit the range of food eligible for the program to healthy options, arguing that such limits would further stereotypes that low-income families made bad decisions. In 2008, Congress changed the food stamp program to Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program with the goal of putting healthy food within reach. However, ongoing efforts to eliminate unhealthy food from the program has been rejected by the USDA. Further efforts to collect information on the types of food that program participates obtain has also been met by the refusal of retailers to comply. To be sure, it's hard to argue that SNAP has not had a tremendous impact on food insecurity. In 2020, SNAP provided almost 40 million adults with an average of $155 per month in food benefits. Yet, political polarization continues to threaten the program. Former President Donald Trump uh, introduced in the 2018 Farm Bill amendments that would change the SNAP program into a block grant program, introduce more stringent work requirements for program recipients, and alter the food plan calculation used to determine benefits. Such amendments were ultimately, ultimately rejected because they would have removed a tremendous amount of people from the program. What does this have to do with the 13th Amendment? Well, let me first tell you a little bit about the 13th Amendment and then explain how uh, food insecurity can arguably be seen as an extension of some of the badges and incidents of the enslavement era. When President Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation on January 1st, 1863, declaring that human enslavement in the Confederate States of America was outlawed, many Southern enslavers did not concede to his authority. As a result, many enslaved people were not in fact told that they were free. It would take over two and a half years for the practice of slavery to officially end on June 19th, 1865 in Texas. However, although June 19th is celebrated today in cities across America and widely known as Juneteenth, it was not until the ratification of the 13th Amendment on December 6, 1865, that emancipation finally materialized for the enslaved people in two Union border states, Delaware and Kentucky. The 13th Amendment was the first of three Reconstruction Amendments passed after the Civil War that sought to eliminate the practice of human enslavement in the United States. Under Section 1, it declares neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as a, punish, as a punishment for crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. Section two of the amendment provides Congress with the power to enforce the amendment by appropriate legislation. In so doing, the drafters of the 13th Amendment recognized that it was not enough to merely abolish the practice of human chattel slavery in America rebuilding the nation after an intense period of war and political division required an empowered state to affirmatively dismantle the toxic culture of white supremacy that infringed upon the liberty interest of formerly enslaved people and hindered their equal citizenship. Anti-slavery advocates understood that the liberty of newly freed black Americans was threatened by socio-cultural norms that perpetuated the material conditions of their former enslavement. Thus, leading advocates of the 13th Amendment during the congressional debates that, fo that followed the Civil War called for an end to all forms of subjugation associated with American slavery. Many, even, many emphasized the need for the government to protect the negative liberty interests of Black Americans or a right to be free from the interference of overt racial discrimination. Representative John F. Farnsworth of Illinois highlighted the importance of protecting familial autonomy or the right to create and maintain a family free from public and private interference. Senator James Harlan of Iowa argued 
uh, that the interference with family life, discriminatory jury selections, and barriers to property ownership constitutes incidents of slavery. Senator Henry Wilson of Massachusetts also underscored the ability to provide for one's family as a defining measure of liberty, declaring the sacred rights of human nature, the hollowed family relations of husband and wife, parent and child will be protected by the guardian spirit of that law, which makes sacred alike the proud homes and lowly cabins of freedom. Other advocates stress the need for Congress to leverage its powers under the enforcement clause of the 13th Amendment to promote the positive liberty interests of Black Americans or a right to be free from the domination of others that might impair their political equality and ultimately degrade their citizenship. For example, Representative Colfax of Indiana declared to enact legislation which shall establish constitutional state government anew on such a basis of enduring justice as will guarantee all necessary safeguards to the people and afford what our Magna Carta and Declaration of Independence proclaims is the chief objective of government, protection to all men of their inalienable rights. Representative William Kelly of Pennsylvania argued the amendment was designed to accomplish the very purpose with which they charged us in the beginning, namely the abolition of slavery in the United States and the political and social elevation of Negroes to all the rights of white men. Notwithstanding a, vis a visible political will among lawmakers for progressive legislation, the Supreme Court quickly took steps to narrow the scope of the 13th Amendment in several seminal cases following the Reconstruction era. During Reconstruction, Congress passed the Civil Rights Act of 1875 to protect all citizens in their civil and legal rights. However, in 1883, the Supreme Court ruled in the civil rights cases that the 13th and 14th Amendments to the Constitution did not grant Congress the power to prohibit racial discrimination by private individuals in public places of accommodations. Writing for the majority, Justice Bradley declared that the 14th Amendment was not designed to meddle with the individual invasion of individual rights, but more pointedly, to nullify and render void all state legislation and state action of every kind that impairs the privileges and immunities of citizens, injures them in life, liberty, or property without due process of law, or denies them equal protection of the law. Regarding the 13th Amendment, Justice Bradley concluded that it merely abolishes slavery, contending that when a man has emerged from slavery, there must be some stage in the progress of his elevation where he takes the rank of a mere citizen and when his rights as a citizen or man, where he noted, uh, Justice Harlan proclaimed that since slavery was the moving or principal cause of the adoption of the 13th Amendment, and since that institution rested wholly upon the inferiority as a race of those held in bondage, their freedom necessarily involved immunity from and protection against all discrimination against them because of their race in respect of such civil rights as belongs to free men of other races. Harlan's sole dissenting opinion, deeming the majority's interpretation contrary to the substance and spirit of the 13th Amendment was not enough to dissuade the court. While Justice Bradley's majority opinion included important language for future federal legislation, affirming that the 13th Amendment clothes Congress with the power to pass all laws necessary and proper for abolishing all badges and incidents of slavery in the United States. Such legislation was limited to incidents of indentured servitude until the civil rights era. The court finally expanded Congress's authority under the 13th Amendment's enforcement clause in Jones v. Mayer in 1968. In that case, the Supreme Court considered whether the private owner of an apartment dwelling could refuse to sell the property to an interracial couple based on their race. The court concluded assessing the plaintiff's claim under Section 1982 of the Civil Rights Act of 1866 that the enforcement power of Congress under the 13th Amendment authorized 
government regulation of racial discrimination in both the private and public sale of property. According to the court, racial discrimination in housing was a badge and incident of slavery because it included restraints upon those fundamental rights, which are the essential, which are the essence of civil freedom, namely the same rights enjoyed by white citizens. Explaining the legislative intent of the Civil Rights Act of 1866, the court cited Senator Trumbell's introduction to the bill, which noted that the act sought to give effect to the 13th Amendment and secure to all persons within the United States practical freedom. Thus, beyond outlawing all forms of slavery and involuntary servitude, the Jones Court made clear that the 13th Amendment gave Congress the power rationally to determine what are the badges and incidents of slavery and the authority to translate that determination into effective legislation. Since Jones, the court has narrowly interpreted the range of conditions that might constitute modern badges and incidents of slavery and involuntary servitude. Further, it has declined to extend the reach of the 13th Amendment beyond cases arising in relation to congressional legislation. Notwithstanding, scholars have not only argued that the scope of the amendment encompasses liberty interests far beyond reasonable compensation for work, but also that the spirit of the amendment should inspire broader and more expansive interpretations that might engender a progressive constitutionalism rooted in dismantling white supremacy's enduring legacy. Who Justice Sc Scholar Andrea Freeman argues that Congress's enforcement power recognized by the Jones Court should be extended to include legislation that seeks to eliminate racial food inequality. To be sure, such an extension requires that one reasonably believe that racial food inequality constitutes a badge and incident of slavery that restrains those fundamental rights, which are the essence of civil freedom. The Supreme Court has demonstrated that a badge and incident of slavery and involuntary, involuntary servitude need not be directly tied to the practice of American enslavement and indentured servitude during the antebellum era. Instead, it need merely reflect an extension of American chattel slavery's culture of racialized human subjugation leveled at the expense of, at the expense of individual social and economic liberty. Put simply, can one discover badges of human deprivation and incidents of social subordination today that reflect the hauntology of chattel slavery and involuntary, involuntary servitude from the Reconstruction era. Racial food apartheid, I would argue, in America today can reasonably be conceived as specters of the racial food equality that characterized antebellum America. How do we see this? Low-income communities and racially and ethnically minoritized communities are often isolated into communities of food deprivation. They're overly exposed to food-related disease and they're, they're given inadequate access to healthy and nutrient-rich food by living in food deserts or food swamps. To the extent that local governments or even the federal government can be held accountable for the construction of communities that impose uh, these dignitary harms upon its residents, I think there's a plausible argument that the enforcement clause of the 13th Amendment gives us some inspiration to think about a progressive vision of the Constitution that can enshrine legislation that supports uh, recognition of social and economic rights. I think with that vision in mind, we can begin to think more progressively about the kinds of legislation that we have been creating to address food insecurity. Uh, given the time, I'm gonna stop here and to allow any time for some discussion. Thank you for that uh, very uh, informative uh, lecture, both in terms of the uh, historical coverage 
Uh, and uh, you're linking that into uh, our constitutional uh, history uh, and uh, obviously uh, tying it into uh, our contemporary social uh, issues uh, and more specifically uh, that of uh, food insecurity. Um, I, th I think uh, we all benefited greatly from that. Uh, you do have a historical question uh, that has been submitted. Uh, and let me go ahead and uh, uh, share that with the audience. Uh, some have argued uh, that more restrictive hunting laws enacted in the South uh, during the Jim Crow era were also designed to limit the ability of formerly enslaved people to feed themselves, uh, making them more dependent on the sharecropper system. Uh, have you looked into this? Uh, do you agree uh, with this argument? I think this is a fantastic point. Uh, it, it's something that I think is a broader uh, extension of um, our gun right laws and the extent to which the ownership of guns has often been suppressed uh, among low income populations and in black communities in particular. I think that historical fact is fascinating and something I'm going to look further into, but it makes perfect sense to me. Um, you know, one typically thinks about the limitation of gun ownership as a way to prohibit sort of revolutionary action among the low income and black population. But I think in particular during the reconstruction era, the former plantation owners, the former planters were specifically focused on finding out how to get those formerly enslaved workers back onto the plantation. Um, and so what could they do to develop this sharecropping system such that they could maintain the, the plantation economy uh, even after the emancipation of slavery? So I think that's an excellent, excellent insight. And I think it's directly tied to this idea of, of, of suppressing the Black population during that era. Sure. Uh let me ask a question. If I followed your uh, uh, argument uh, toward the uh, uh, end of your presentation, um, are you, are you, uh, particularly your reference to the 13th Amendment, uh, if I recall correctly, uh, Congress has the ability to enforce that amendment. Uh, are you, you uh, focusing more on uh, the, trying to secure congressional enforcement of that amendment or uh, having the courts intervene uh, and uh, recognize, uh, you know, in essence, a sort of a food dignity right uh, 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 based upon that constitutional provision? Yeah, I think both are pos possible. I think my emphasis is more so on the latter, which is to say courts recognizing uh, a dignity right in that regard. Um, and to that extent, I think the recent resistance to the Biden administration's um, debt relief package for black farmers is one where we could think about courts responding to some of those constitutional challenges by elevating the 13th Amendment into that discourse, which is to say, although the, the debt that's, that those black farmers are seeking relief from is connected to intentional discrimination from the USDA, I think the challenges that farmers have endured and, and some of the issues related to food security that black farming is seeking to overcome more generally can be tied to this broader history of food insecurity. And so while that particular program has received pushback as being unconstitutional because it specifically targets um, a, a class of farmers by race, I think one could introduce into that conversation the enforcement power of the 13th Amendment, which is to say that is a program that is specifically designed to begin to disentangle some of these vestiges of the, the conditions, uh, the, food oppress, the food oppression conditions that, that we can draw a link to the antebellum era. Right. Uh, th th thank you uh, on that. Uh, I see we have a, another question. Uh, <clears throat> what do you think about uh, efforts uh, to restrict uh, food choice as it relates to uh, the SNAP uh, program? Yeah, I think it's a complex issue. I, I certainly think that 
of food justice advocates who believe that there should not be restrictions are actually correct in the sense that uh, limiting choice among certain populations based on the notion that they are more likely to make bad food purchasing decisions. And when I say bad food, I mean unhealthy food purchasing decisions than more economically uh, empowered communities, I think sort of reinforces and perpetuate the stigma that is associated with such low in communities. I also think it's somewhat of a red herring, which is to say it centers the problem on the decision making of the consumers themselves and not on the, the access to different options that they have at their disposal. And of course, we have to remember that access is also shaped by price. So often those unhealthy food options are not being selected uh, solely because, you know, poor people just like the way unhealthy food tastes, but unhealthy food is typically the cheapest food in the store. Um, whereas if you want to eat organic food, if you want to eat fresh food, it's often far more expensive and sort of out of the reach of many populations. Um, and even when they can afford such food with the help of food stamps, they're, they're continuing to make trade-offs with respect to whether they spend that extra cash on the, the, the organic food versus spending that extra money on, you know, health care or other things that their family needs. So I, to me, I think the question is sort of redesigning communities such that everyone has affordable access to healthy food and has the education necessary to know how to construct a healthy diet. Right. So uh, the uh, uh, questioner has a follow-up uh, asking, uh, I think you've sort of hinted at this, uh, would you uh, uh, say that in uh, incentivizing uh, healthier food choices uh, would be better than uh, constraining them? I, I think it's certainly an option that actually has been tried in the past and has worked. I mean, when the first food stamp program was created, it was created with two food stamps. And when you used the orange food stamp, that gave you the ability to use the blue food stamp for the purchase of surplus um, farming produce, which were vegetables, fruits, beans, et cetera. And in those immediate years after the introduction of the very first food stamp program, there, there were a tremendous number of individuals who took advantage of those blue food stamps and were purchasing vegetables, um, you know, fruits, beans, and other things. So I, I do think that incentives are helpful, but I wouldn't necessarily frame it as an incentive per se, because I think the framing suggests that um, certain populations need to be encouraged to eat healthy. I think the incentive is simply making it uh, financially attractive, which is to say, if it's uh, affordable to purchase healthy food, or if in fact, if healthy food is cheaper than unhealthy food, then people will purchase healthy food. Um, so that said, if the incentive is an economic incentive, which is to say, it's, it ends up being uh, more economically attractive for certain families to purchase healthy food, then I think that's a great option for cities to consider. Right. Great. Thank you. Uh, another question uh, has come in. Uh, the uh, uh, existing farm bill subsidies and price supports uh, favor big uh, agribusiness uh, to produce large surpluses of a small number of commodity crops, uh, many of which result in uh, unhealthy uh, food, uh, some laced with corn syrup, for example. Uh, at the uh, expense of smaller farmers uh, growing a more uh, uh, diverse <clears throat> range of healthy foods. Uh, would redirecting these subsidies help? Absolutely. Um, and if I had more time to expand the story, you know, I think I spent most of the time talking about the history of food stamps, which I think is really a history about the creation uh, or the history about the implications of food deserts which are places where people can't access food, they don't have enough food, and what has the government done to try to help people 
get the food they need. I think there's a parallel history about the creation of food swamps, which I think is a which I think is a history that pits agribusiness uh, with government and the ability to manipulate subsidies to create cheap commodities that are then targeted toward low income communities. And so there's a reason why it is affordable for businesses to locate fast food restaurants in low income neighborhoods because subsidies facilitate the, the very low pricing of those fast foods that are created with certain commodities. And so I think that is absolutely uh, an area to explore and the redirection of those subsidies, of course, would be met with tremendous uh, pushback um, from those farmers. But I think it would go a long way to sort of rebalancing the, the pricing of you know, mass produced unhealthy food options to fresh produce, you know, uh, vegetables and, and fruits that you have at farmers markets, you know, organic food, et cetera. Um, so I think there's something to be said about the way subsidies shapes the pricing of food and as a result can have uh, a disproportionate sort of a disparate impact on certain communities as a result. Well, I, uh, I think we've uh, accomplished our objective here, uh, both uh, having you uh, enlighten all of us on uh, food deserts, uh, and uh, I think we've given you your next uh, research project on uh, food swamps, huh? Absolutely. <laughs> Okay. Uh, well, we are uh, uh, probably a bit beyond our usual time, uh, but let me uh, first of all uh, thank uh, Professor Etienne Toussaint uh, for this uh, uh, excellent, insightful uh, 17th annual Wallace Stegner Center Young Scholar Lecture. Uh, let me also thank uh, our audience uh, for joining us today. Uh, we very much appreciate your attendance at these events. Uh, we hope that we'll be able to return live in the not too distant uh, future. Uh, let me uh, also uh, remind folks uh, that we will have uh, Stegner Center programs beginning again in January uh, throughout the spring, our Green Bag Series, along with the annual symposium on March 17th and 18th on the Colorado River Compact. Uh, and uh, also, I should note uh, that uh, Professor Toussaint's uh, lecture today will appear uh, eventually uh, in the Utah Law Review, and we're very thankful for uh, his contribution to that. Uh, please join me again virtually in uh, thanking and applauding uh, Professor Toussaint's uh, presentation. And thank you again for joining us. And thank you again, Professor Toussaint. Thank you so much. Thank you.